So as I was trying to say before we were cut off by uh, Zoom, not participating well, that the critical thinking exercise for this week, which is required, is located under week three in the content section of our web page. All right, come on, go to content. Really? Oh, I know why it is. All right, so it's located down here. Important stuff, week one, week two, week three, and then directly under week, week three, activity one, primary source activity. Now, just to give you a quick rundown, what I was trying to talk about was how the Western Hemisphere was not as populous as the Eastern Hemisphere, which is one of the reasons why there weren't as many empires or big groups of people. You did have groups, again, like the Aztecs and the Incas, who were definitely empires in the sense that you had one group of people controlling a whole bunch of other different groups of people, um, different cultural groups, people speaking different languages, uh, people with different customs. Um, an empire is basically constructed of different groups of people with different uh, customs, different cultural backgrounds, often different languages, and even different local political structures that are controlled in a pyramid manner by one group at the top. Um, and probably one of the best examples of this that some of you have already seen and some of you actually demonstrated were, of course, the Spanish and their control of the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And then later, their control not only of those peoples, but also of Africans who were being brought over and sold into slavery. All right. So to understand why Spain is first out of the gate, we have to understand a little bit about the history of Spain. And most of you should have read about this by this point in time. Um, Spain itself had been a collection of kingdoms, the two largest of which had been Castile and Aragon. Um, in the mid-1400s, the kings of Castile and Aragorn, Aragon, sorry, um, basically began to work together. Later, they would actually wed their children, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, together to consolidate their two large sections, uh, their two biggest kingdoms in Spain. Um, their purpose at the time was to try to unite all of Spain under their control, but also to drive out people who didn't believe the same way they did. They were very Catholic, um, and in fact, it is during this period when they are bringing everything together that we get the development of what is called the Spanish Inquisition. And the point of the Inquisition was to make sure that not only everybody who was in Spain was practicing Catholicism, but they were practicing Catholicism exactly the way that the Spanish theologians, the Spanish kings, wanted them to. So it's not just a matter of practicing Catholicism the way that people in France were practicing Catholicism or even the people in, in England at that point in time. This is the uh, before the Protestant Reformation, which begins effectively in 1517 with Martin Luther and then goes through various shifts and changes as different other people began to protest and argue uh, about how one should practice Christianity including people like John Calvin and uh, Ulrich Zwingli and, and those guys, um, the Catholic authorities in Spain believed that they foundationally had a different and correct way to practice Catholicism that sometimes even the popes didn't do. I mean, they were, they were pretty self-assured. And a big part of how they come together with this is because they're trying to get rid of the Muslims who had dominated southern Spain since around the 800s. Um, there's a lot of interesting history in that. Uh, it has to do with the foundations of Islam and then the way that the uh, first big Islamic empire broke apart. And its arguments, uh, or the internal arguments about the practice of the faith versus the politics of the faith. So where we are then 
in the early 1500s and then into the middle 1500s when the Spanish are expanding their control over the Western Hemisphere is that these conquistadors and the people who are coming to the Western Hemisphere have not only a desire for wealth, they also have a desire to add more Catholic converts to their way of defining Catholicism. And it's going to be exacerbated, of course, by the Protestant Reformation. So they have specific ideas about how they should be approaching the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And what I mean by this is not just the Incas and the Aztecs, but pretty much all the different peoples that they are going to encounter. Uh, the Mayans are uh, a big group of people culturally, but they are not an empire. They are a collection of different Mayan kingdoms in much the same way that Western Europeans were collections of different Western people living in Europe. Uh, the Mayans were different groups of Mayans living in specific kingdoms, and they fought amongst each other a lot. One of the big problems for the Mayans was that they never unify because there's too much political infighting amongst the different Mayan states. So we don't call them so much an empire as a, a Mayan civilization or culture. Uh, they shared many of the same cultural characteristics, um, but they didn't, but they never unified. Going back to peoples in the North American areas, there are lots of different cultural groups there, the Mississippians, um, the, the Pueblo peoples, uh, the, the peoples, the, the mound builders in the southeast, the plains people in uh, the plains area of North America. These are all peoples who share a common culture, a common language, but they don't share the same political structures. And one of the reasons for this, and this is where I was going with the diamond part that I was uh, discussing when we started to break up, um, was, as Diamond argues, there was not a critical mass of plants and animals that could be domesticated that would lead to the surplus of foods that allowed peoples to unify in bigger and bigger political organizations and allowed that percentage of people who weren't directly involved with food production to do other things. They never hit that critical population density, or when they did, it wasn't until later, and that's where you get the creation of the Aztecs and the Incas, um, and uh, like the people of Cahokia uh, at one point in time in the 13 and 1400s um, in Central North America. There was a, a, a basically a large city-state called Cahokia uh, that apparently had control of a lot of the area around it, um, but it was more of a trading urban area than it was a large political entity that controlled lots of people. Um, but it did manage to hit a population point where it had enough people who were not directly tied to production of food that it could have a social stratification where you had uh, people who could create other things and do other things like create um, the uh, religious structures for the worship of the gods. Most of the peoples in the Western Hemisphere were still polytheistic, but they had uh, often very elaborate um, religious structures. Uh, you get that with the Incas, the Aztecs, and again the people in Cahokia. You do not get that so much with uh, some of these other peoples because they never hit that critical population mass. And the reason they don't, that critical population density, is because they couldn't produce the varieties and diversity of surplus foods. And this is a big thing. It's going to be, that's one of the things that I was trying to get to when we're talking about the Columbian Exchange, was that this Columbian Exchange allows for the shifting of many foods out of the Western Hemisphere back to the Eastern Hemisphere, which is going to help tremendously with population density there. But there's also going to be the movement, a lot of uh, Eurasian foodstuffs into um, North America, which is going to help there as well. So anyway, going back to trying to tie all of this together where we are with this critical thinking exercise is that what you're going to be doing is going here to the primary source activity. This is part one. There are two parts to this. Part one is the primary source activity itself. 
Now, when you click on this, which is located again under week three in this primary source activity, when you click on this first thing, it's going to download this document. Well, actually, no, it's going to give you instructions. And the instructions are going to tell you to download this document. You're going to download it. Um, here you go, download it. And you're going to open it. And it is a document called the requirement or il requerimento, mentio. Um, it was written in 1513. Uh, the king of Spain at that point in time ordered the conquistadors to read this document, El Requerimiento, to the Native Americans, but they had to read it to them in Spanish. Um, and they had to do it upon first contact. It was prepared by the royal lawyer Juan Lopez Palacios Rubios at the prompting of Spanish theologians. So that gives you some of the background information on this document. And then you're going to read this document itself on the part of the king, Don Fernando and Dona Juana, his daughter, Queen of Castile and Leon. Subduers of the barbarous nations, we, their servants, notify and make known to you, as best we can, that the Lord our God, living and eternal, created the heaven and the earth, and one man and one woman, of whom you and we, all the men of the world, were and are descendants, and all those who came after us. All right, so you're going to read through this document, remembering that it's being read to the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere when the Spanish first meet them, and it's being read to them in Spanish, right? Then you're going to answer these questions. Was the purpose of the document to justify making war on Native Americans, yes or no? Why do you think that? Provide at least one piece of evidence from the document and explain. You can, if you want, go back and change your answer. Re-examine the document, find two pieces of evidence that contradict your reading above and explain how and, and explain how they do so. And then, based on your current understanding, how confident are you in original reading of the document? Explain. And that means how confident are you in your original reading of the document? This exercise is intended to demonstrate the necessity of taking into account context and purpose when examining a primary source. And what we mean by purpose here is why this document was written. Today, we write all the time. We don't even think about it. In fact, we even do talk to text, so we don't even have to physically write. We can speak into our uh, cell phones. We can speak into um, Dragon Naturally something. I can't remember what the program is. It's a great program. You can speak into that, and it will interpret what you're saying into text, so you don't even actually have to write at all. But up until the 1800s, up until the 1800s, the vast majority of people in the world collectively did not read or write. And when someone from that 20 to 25 percentile of people in the larger empires who could read and write did actually write, they usually had a reason to do it because paper or anything you were writing on was expensive, ink was expensive, um, you didn't just frivolously write. Um, you couldn't go back and erase it and save the paper to use later. In fact, we actually now have lots of historical documents that have been written, have been written over three and four times um, because paper was expensive and ink was expensive. So people reused everything they had. So in this sense, when you're looking at historical documents, you really want to consider why someone took the time to write this down. And this is a big part of what purpose is. What did they hope to achieve by doing this? Students often misunderstand historical documents by focusing too much on one piece of the document. And to be fair, they're not alone in this. Uh, historians themselves can get caught up in interminable debates, believe me, I know, uh, about one sentence in a document, completely misinterpreting it in context to the rest of it. Which is why the best defense is to take a holistic approach and to carefully consider the other available evidence in the document as well. Read the whole document and ask if ask yourself if your interpretation still makes sense.
Also, who wrote it? Who was it addressed to? Uh, in this case, who would be able to understand it? Does this piece of evidence match other evidence you have seen? If not, can you reconcile them? Or have you simply misunderstood what was there? With all of that in mind, how might you go about figuring the most correct interpretation of this document? See if you can think of two kinds of evidence you could seek out outside the document to help you understand it. All right, so you're going to answer these things. You're going to uh, write your answers in those boxes. You're going to save this document that you have now answered, and you're going to go and upload it to the Dropbox created for it. Here's the primary source activity, the requirement submission. It's going to take you, if you click on that, to the primary source activity part one submissions. You can also find it under activities assignments, primary source activity requirement one. And you're going to do that by <coughs> Saturday night. You're going to do that by Saturday night. Now, there is a second part to this. Um, which is located, once again, back under here. It also has a thing in your um, thing. There's a primary source activity, too, which you cannot start doing until Sunday morning, but it is due by Monday evening. What you're going to do with it after you've done part one is uh, starting on Sunday morning, I'm going to upload for you into a different folder, and I'll show you where it is, or I'll tell you where it is, some examples of answers like the one you wrote. And you're going to take one of those and you're going to score it with the rubric that is also included. So for primary source activity two, after you submit your responses, um, it says watch this video about scoring the activity. I'll make one since apparently I'm going to have to since I can't go over this with you. Then open the following folder, scored exercise, um, and Give a score for each question and briefly state your reasons for giving that score. And that's what this is going to be. And I'll have those examples for you. You may pick one and do it. You can read through a few of them and do them, but you want to do one. And then you're going to upload that one once you save it. When you've scored one and given your reasons for doing so, you're going to do the, um, you're going to upload it to the scored exercise. And then you're going to submit the SNL reflection for this activity. The instructions for that are there. So the whole idea is to get you to think about different ways to interpret a document and how other people might also interpret it differently from you. Okay, so that's what you're doing with this. Now, again, the first part, the part where you actually do your analysis is due Saturday night. The second part where you score one is due Monday night. I know this sounds confusing. Don't worry about it. You got it. I'll help you through this. Like I said, I will upload examples for you to actually score um, Sunday morning so that you'll have those so that you may do that part. Okay. So I've been asked to also do uh, a quick thing on the final project and the final project proposal. I've sent those documents to you. I'm not going to do the final project right now. I'm going to do the final project proposal since that is what is due to you, um, is due to me, due to me on September the 9th. All right, so this is due in week four at the end of week four. Having spent several weeks reading through the different sources from your current world issues, which you should have been doing by reading through the news feeds, consider the most serious issues in the world today. And these are going to be, again, the ones facing your generation. Then choose one that you think is the most serious and that you can do or want to do the research on. All right. You're going to submit a document to me that answers these four sets of questions. The first question, identify the issue and cite two sources from your news feed. And they have to be written sources. Two sources that you have read about this particular issue. Why do you think that this is the most serious issue or one of the most serious issues facing us today? Are there others that are equally concerning? 
If so, why is this the one you chose? All right, that's the first part. It's probably going to be the longest part because you've got to do that citation in there. You've got to use uh, the two sources from your newsfeed um, and explain, you know, kind of what they say and how, how it gets to that. Second part, what sort of project do you want to do? Is this going to be a paper, a multimedia or video project or something else? And again, you can propose something else, except I am not going to accept a podcast of you reading the paper. I'm not going to accept a PowerPoint. It can be something else, but it's got to be something substantive. Are you going to be doing it? Okay, well, no, actually, sorry, that's part three. Why do you want to do this and why should I let you? And that's a big part of what your proposal argument is. What, why do you think this is that important? The third section of your proposal will basically be short. Are you going to do it by yourself or are you going to be working in a group? And as I said in the course of uh, the class that ended, if you want to do it as a group, uh, once you pick whatever your topic is, which you'll need to do pretty quickly, um, I will be glad to post to everyone in the class that you want to do this and you're looking for someone to work with you. Um, or y'all can email each other. I don't care. Again, I think you can go to the class list link on our D2L uh, page and mass email everybody. You can either put me in it or leave me out, however you want to do it, or I can do it for you, whatever. If you do want to do a group project, you must list all of the members, uh, but there can be no more than three total. And as I mentioned, for every person in the group, you <clears throat> have to count more like if uh, if the minimum number for one person doing it is a 10 page 10, 10 pages of text or five minutes of video then if you have two people it's got to be 20 pages of text or 10 minutes of video or if you have three people it's got to be 30 pages of text and 15 minutes of video minimums right so for every person there you have to increase by that percentage and then the fourth part what do you hope to achieve or to learn or to prove with this project and this topic. All right, that is the proposal, which is due to me on September the 9th. Um, as of September the 9th, or actually September the 10th, I'll start going through them. If I approve it, I'll send it back to you. Uh, I'll try to include my ideas or some places you can go to look for things or some information um, that you might wanna consider um, if I don't approve it, I'll make some alternate suggestions or discuss some ways in which to finesse the project or to change it so that it's something that I would do. But that'll give you some time to begin to think about it. All right. As I said, when we left class or as I typed in the chat window, um, email me if you still have questions. Um, your, if you choose to do the third discussion, the top post for it is due on Thursday night. If you choose not to, that's fine, but I encourage you to at least think about doing the third discussion because I'm going to pick your top six discussion grades and your four top critical thinking exercises grades to count for those 50 percentile marks. So the more discussions you have, the better you're going to get at doing them. Um, the same with the CTEs. The more of those you do, the better you're going to get at doing them. Starting in week four, next week, you will have the option to do the CTE, ACTE, it won't be the same one, ACTE or a discussion, or again, you can do both. It's entirely up to you, but it'll depend on, you know, how many options, how many different types of things you want to choose from. And the CTEs are all going to be very similar to this one. They're going to be analyses of documents, whether it be a primary source document or a secondary source document. These are designed to try to help you get ready for that annotated bibliography, which is due in week 10. So. All right, I'm going to end here. I'm going to send this video link, and I'm going to send you the final project instructions and the final project proposal instructions as well, this thing that you see in front of you. All right, if you have questions, let me know.